Hey, thanks for joining me today as we are continuing to look at Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. Really, it should be 1 through 14, but I condensed it down to just those four verses because Paul tells uh, in a very condensed fashion in verse 1 and 2 what he expands on in verses 8 through 11, really through 14. Uh, but 8 through 11 really gets the gist of of this uh, of what Paul is saying in verses 1 and 2. And we've looked at verses 8, verse 9. Today we're looking at verse 10, which is a parallel of verse 9. Then we'll finish it up by looking at verse 11 tomorrow. And what we have seen so far is this... Um, the love of God, and it really, what I'm trying to get across in looking at these verses is the value of humanity, and really you could say that you can see the value of humanity all the way from Genesis chapter 3, where God promises a rescuer to come, uniquely born of woman, through, through Abraham, through Noah, through uh, David, through the promises that are made, the covenants that are made, with the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the Noahic covenant, um, the covenant there that is made in, uh, in the Adamic covenant. Uh, so you have this throughout uh, the Bible uh, that that God is uh, valuing humanity to such a degree that He's rescuing humanity, really rescuing humanity from humanity's self, our own self-destructive decisions, our own uh, giving over to the dark forces and and uh, worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Um, demonic forces, worshiping and serving demonic forces, that kind of thing that we see clearly uh, upon the outset of sin entering the world. There's murder that follows and it, it's uh, uh, murder, brother murders brother and, and, and on and on it goes. The violence escalates and the killing and the violence and the, the immorality, the sexual immorality and all of these things to the point that God says, I've got to start over and preserve Noah and his family and he starts from there. And then sin begins again uh, right after that, right after the flood. And, and you see this narrowed down to this one man, Abraham, and the family that's going to bring the deliverer, uh, to be the vehicle of bringing the Messiah in, into the world. Uh, is that uh, family of Abraham and the promises that are made concerning Messiah and so forth uh, and the prophecies concerning who he is. So all of that, we, we could say, demonstrates the value of humanity because God loves humanity. But to the degree of giving his son, that, that is the ultimate price that is paid to rescue, to save humanity from being separated from God and from uh, from death in the sense of not necessarily physical death because none of us are saved from that but the death that uh, within Greek and Hebrew the both languages of the uh, the old and the New Testament whether it's Aramaic or whether it's Hebrew or whether it's uh, New Testament Greek in either case the idea behind death is separation there is a separation from uh, and when the scripture speaks of it it is separation ultimately from God the physical death is separation from the person, from the body, but the, the separation from God, that's the death that is quite often referred to. That's certainly the death that is referred to uh, that is the result of sin and that it, we are separated from God. We personally are separated from God. And that should not be. That is not the way it's supposed to be. And so something has to be done. Humanity is too weak to do anything about it. So if something is going to be done, God must do something about it. And so he does in giving his son and so that illustrates the love that God has for humanity, the love that God has for human beings, the value he places on man and woman. And, you know, when we, we started out this series to answer questions about gender ideology and uh, sexuality and so forth, and we have talked about um, how God has created human beings, male and female, to reflect his image. We've talked about all of that and how important it is that those two exist. And you cannot violate those boundaries. You can have surgery and you can put on makeup and you can masquerade as a male or a female, depending on which one you're pretending to be, but that's all it will be. You cannot fundamentally change what we have been made by God. And that's, to me, that is like the, the epitome 
of arrogance to say that we have the capabilities to change that and we will decide what there again goes back to choosing the tree of n the knowledge of good and evil uh, knowing we will determine what's right we'll do something without God and that kind of thing and it leads to this catastrophe this sin that separates us from God that that causes this separation to exist. And so God does something. We looked at that in verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In that succinct little phrase, there's so much theology, so much soteriology that is tied up in that. The love of God is demonstrated over and over and over again in this once for all death of his son, Jesus Christ, for us. That's sacrifice for us. And Jesus willingly does that. The son of God willingly goes to the cross, willingly takes um, the sin upon himself takes that wrath upon sin and all upon himself and uh, extinguishes it. Uh, it does away with its power through his death and then the validation that that has been taken care of is his life, his resurrection. And we look at verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on the cross, our, our believing in that uh, work on the cross, believing that Jesus is the Messiah, we receive that grace of God, uh, that we have been justified, declared innocent in the court, uh, because that justified de causa language is um, is law court language. It is language to say that we we are been we've been declared innocent. We've been declared in the right. The court is found in our favor. Uh, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him through our relationship with Jesus Christ, through what he has done because we are now placed into him, we are rescued from the wrath that is coming against uh, evil uh, and against, it is ultimately against wickedness, but it is wickedness as lived out by human beings. And it's not that God is angry with human beings. God is wrathful against that which corrupts his creation. And if you're going to participate in that corruption, then you fall under that wrath as well <clears throat> as a willing participant because a way has been provided away from that. Uh, the love of God, the grace of God has been bestowed upon humanity, and we may accept that or we may reject that. Verse 10, For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now notice, verse 10 is a parallel to verse 9. For if while we were enemies, much more than um, having been justified by his blood, we'll be saved from the wrath of God. Uh, go back up to verse 8. Well, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All right, so there is enmity between us and God. And, and that runs both ways, by the way. For while we were enemies, uh, we, were, we were enemies. We were continually enemies. We were enemies of God, re rebels against God. We were entangled in sin and therefore death. And we are separated from God because of that sin, because of that um, unholiness that is in us, because of that corruption that is in us. Uh, it separates us from God because God is holy, cannot be a part of that, and cannot enter into that. And so he makes a way to reconcile us. And that's a flip on the words there because the substitution is uh, to be justified is a law court term, is to be declared in the right or innocent by the court of law. To be reconciled, this word reconciled, uh, katalasso, means to, um, to bring uh, hostile parties or estranged parties uh, together again, to, to bring them together and to make peace between. So you have two parties that are at enmity with one another. They're, they are hostile toward one another, and they are brought together. They are reconciled. Peace is made between the two. The two are brought back together. Uh, this was done while we were rebellious, while we were sinners, while we were enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So in passive tense, we were reconciled. God is the one who is doing the reconciling. He's the one who is bringing peace, and he's doing so through the death of his son. So his son, Jesus' death on the cross becomes that vehicle by which we are reconciled. It, the, the thing that reconciles us, the thing that brings peace. How does it bring peace? Because sin is dealt with. Sin is done away with. 
this corruption is done away with. It is like uh, taking that live wire and doing away with it. It's grounded out. It just can't do anything anymore. The power of sin is broken. Um, it no longer uh, does it hold sway in our lives. We are set free from that. We are declared innocent as Jesus is declared innocent because the sin issue is dealt with. It's dealt with on the cross. He experiences all of it. He experiences sin being placed upon him. He experiences the wrath of God upon that sin and the separation, the, the experiencing hell on the cross for us. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That whole uh, quoting of the psalm. Uh, there is a turning away of God the Father from the Son. There is this experiencing hell for us. And if he doesn't experience that, then he can't, he hasn't experienced all of it for us. And he has taken the fullness of it upon himself. So we're reconciled by his death. And God, it's passive tense, God is the one who is doing that, bringing that peace between believers and God himself. Having been reconciled, and this is something that happened in the past, but it continues on. Having been reconciled, we've been reconciled through what? Through faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the one who does away with sin. We accept that gift, and it is applied to us as well. We're declared in the right. We're reconciled. God reconciles himself to us. It is a reconciliation that he does. He does it. Um, Uh, so much, so much more having been reconciled since we've been, since we've been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, what does that mean that we will be saved by his life? Well, it's paralleling that we will be rescued from the wrath that is poured out on the last day. Uh, what does it mean by his life uh, or uh, through the agency, through, uh, yeah, through the agency of his life? That is the, the means by which we are saved. What life would his death? Yes, that's sin. But his life, that resurrection life, that that life that uh, that we celebrate Easter Sunday morning, uh, the, the life, the the resurrection life, that because of that we are rescued as well because we're made alive too, and so we are rescued from the judgment and wrath of the last day that is poured out on all of wickedness before the new creation new heaven, new earth, before all of that. And we are already that. Now, we won't be complete until we see Jesus there, as the Scripture tells us in, in 1 John. Uh, when we see him, then we're transformed. And there's something about seeing him that transforms us, as N.T. Wright says on that very passage. Uh, but, but the point is that it is his resurrection life. Well, is it important that we believe in the resurrection? Absolutely, it's important. If there is no resurrection, there is no resurrection for you or for me. There is no rescue for you and for me uh, in this life to come. Uh, and, and at the end, when, when God's wrath and his judgment is poured out upon evil and wickedness, and if people continue in wickedness and refuse the grace of God, as we know Revelation tells us they will, uh, then it will be poured out on them as well. So we have been rescued from that. Now, to me, that shows the, the tremendous value that God places upon human beings in that he would go so far as to give his son and that the second person of the Trinity uh, takes on flesh, Jesus, and willingly, obediently doing the will of the Father, goes to the cross uh, to take our place, goes to the cross so that sin... Uh, can be snuffed out in him, the power of sin is broken in the cross, and that life that he lives and that is shared with us as we are placed in him by the Holy Spirit when we believe in Jesus, that we have that shared life put in us. We're new creatures, and we have this new life, and it's because of that life that we have salvation or rescue from the judgment that is coming upon uh, all wickedness and evil. Well, so we're going to tie that up tomorrow when we look at verse 11, and I pray that you know the love of God, and I pray that you know how value, valuable you are to God, that you are precious in his sight, uh, and that he loves you, loves you so much that he gave his son, gave his son uh, to do away with sin, to bring you into a right relationship with him so you could have forgiveness of sin and be restored in your vocation and relationship with God. Have eternal life so you will live forever, be able to experience the, uh, God always in the way that we were created to experiencing him and to enjoy the new creation, the new heaven and new earth and to explore and be creative and to experience all kinds of relationships. And then third, 
uh, you'll have joy indescribable, joy that comes from being free from sin and death, the joy that comes from knowing that God is working all things out. And if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you not only have those, you have the peace of God that only the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, can bring. You'll have that shalom, that stillness, that quietness, that assurance that God is in control, working all things out. He's got a plan. He's taking you to be with him. You're going to experience the whole thing. Uh, and that no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens in this world that is unwinding like a ball of yarn, and will, as God said it will in his word, and we can have peace in the midst of all of that because we know God is working all things out, and we know the end. We know how it works out in a new creation, new heaven and earth, and a new Jerusalem, and we get to experience all of that. How marvelous is that? Hey, listen, I pray that you know that. I pray that you think on that. I pray that you embrace that as you embrace the Savior, Jesus Christ, as Lord, and then uh, bow before him. And I pray that, that you know his peace, the peace that only he brings. Until tomorrow, I pray that that peace, God's shalom, rests upon you always, my friend. See you tomorrow. Shalom.